Left in Kentucky, the podcast of Indivisible Northern Kentucky. Welcome back, everybody. No, it's been, it's been a little bit since we've been with you. We told you it might be a while. We did not lie. Yeah, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> And with me is my, oh, this is Roberto Enriquez, of course. And with me, as always, is the lovely and talented Miss Ann Dickerson. Hey, everybody. And the also lovely and talented Miss Amy Ferguson. Hello. <laughs> so, how you guys been? Groovy. Groovy. Um, I'm yeah. glad the primary is over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, primary season. We're finally past primary season. Gotta love that. So, it, it's crazy because there's so little time to recover compared to what there have been in years past. I know it's with with moving it. It's uh, it's thrown everybody's schedule off. So, um, but before we get into that, and we will be talking about the primary and primary results coming up. Um, but before that, we have our usual. Um, our uh, usual segments that everybody loves are cow patties and our bullhorn. So let's see, cow patties. Who wants to start with the cow patties? Ooh, I can. Okay, why don't you start, Miss Ann? You is know. this a new person, Ann, or is it someone <laughs> we've heard of before? Like, oh my God! Somebody we've <laughs> never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. gonna come. It's gonna come across like I have this personal vendetta, <laughs> but this man just cannot shut up and act like a decent human being. I can't stand it anymore. My <laughs> <laughs> my cow patty goes to Damon Thayer again. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, I know he's a, a horse track fan. He owns horses. He's invested, la, la, la. But there is not a bigger horse's ass on the planet than him. Mm -hmm. and there's, <laughs> there's some reason there's that connection in his life. <laughs> um, you know, and there are literally a litany of things that I could go off on about him since the last time that we did our podcast. But number one is going to be this because it's, it's, it's the main topic of our whole day today, which is he is actively promoting hashtag normal in November. And uh, like he would know normal if it hit him over the head. Sorry. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, he posted... <laughs> <laughs> she can't even get through it i can't help it he posted this just dorky selfie on twitter where he's it's a close-up i mean like his face is just wham right there <laughs> <laughs> like, like he just held it out far enough to fit the majority of his face in the screen and it's obvious that he's kicking his car and he puts, I voted in person today, and while it was very smooth process in Scott County, I'll be urging a return to hashtag normal in November, hashtag voting matters. And I'm just sitting here, just, uh, I'm like, dude. <laughs> do, do he's a poster read, child. Yeah, do you read a freaking newspaper? <laughs> I mean, seriously, we had almost Fake news. We had almost record turnout. Uh, you know, the turnout where he was was like a quarter, if that, of the overall vote because so many people voted using the absentee ballot, mail-in ballot system that was developed. I mean, was it perfect? No. But it certainly helped to keep people safe. It certainly helped avoid lines and and crowds and all kinds of things and and we have the numbers climbing again for covid and this jackal is talking about normal <laughs> in November. okay so let's play the stupid or evil game Ooh. Is it because he really thinks that it's not a problem or is that he doesn't care if people die mm. Which no it's because, it's because he knows 
that with systems like this, he and his pals have a greater chance of getting voted out because Democrats came out and voted at a higher percentage turnout rate than Republicans. And that almost never happens for it to happen in a primary is freaking huge. Yeah. Huge. Now, granted, you know, and, and some people will say, oh, well, you know, the Republicans didn't have as much to to you know, send them to the polls because Mitch McConnell was always going to win. It wasn't a real primary, whereas Democrats had, you know, a lot of stuff going on on their side, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't matter because history shows us that even when we've had super competitive races in the past, you know, Republicans have still always come out in a higher percentage, Mm -hmm. always. And so to have this happen now in a primary it brings a lot of hope. Hope. For what could be in what what things are likely to look like in November. Um, it's so a light at the end of the tunnel in November. It is. And that's the drive behind this push to beat it back. The fact of the matter is, and I, you, you know, Twitter's my crack. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter whose post I go on to, I've ne- I've yet to get a response from this, right? And it's that paper ballots, the mail-in ballots are more account- have more accountability than hackable voting machines. True. It's been proven time and time and time again because you have that paper trail. And no one, not one of these Republicans, not anybody else who's spoken up about it has been able to contradict that. Nobody has come out with any proof to the contrary proof you don't need proof you just make wild accusations right right <laughs> and the fact logic that there's like you know voter fraud true voter fraud in the united states the occurrence is like 0.001 i mean it's some ridiculously facts. low number because it almost never happens the secretary of state himself couldn't point to a single incident in the entire state And yet we have, you know, Kentucky's own horse's ass out here saying we need to return to normal. Plus, you know, not only is he advocating that with his return to normal, he's also going to all these interim uh, committee meetings and doing everything in his world without wearing a mask. Nice. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised either. See, that puts me on the stupid side. But I don't know, evil. I don't know. It could be both. It almost it almost makes you want to. Uh, they should have a a. You know how they had used to have um, chicken pox parties for kids. They should have a yeah. COVID party for those guys. Yeah, yeah, and that's what would have happened if Bevin would have still been governor. You know, if, no since way. you don't believe in masks and you think it's it's fine, that's fine. You all get together and and hang out and do your thing and, and we'll see how that works out for you. Right. I mean, there's a section of hell right now that is freezing over and donkeys are flying because even McConnell is pushing for masks. I know. I saw and that. Saying, I, 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 and I, saying that. I mean, if you see well, I saw face. that I saw that tweet and I from McConnell saying everybody should wear a mask. It's not a political thing. First, I had to look and see, am, is this a is this a a, a fake McConnell <laughs> account? And then I saw that it was really his account that he said that on the actual Mitch right. McConnell on Twitter. And I'm like, OK, we have obviously fallen through some wormhole into no. an alternate universe. You guys, now. you guys, have you seen his face? Wouldn't you want to cover that, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the the bug eyes are still yeah. out there. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. They're they're dear leader. The dude who holds the purse strings, the dude who pulls all the legislative strings all the way down to the state level, whether people want to admit it or not. You know, he's advocating for it, and the minions have not caught up yet. Yep. So I, I just, I, I sit here and I see this, and I'm like, you are just, you know, he's a heartless bastard. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if your grandma dies. He no. doesn't care if your, you know, child that's immunocompromised dies. He doesn't care. He just wants his horse track open 
so that he doesn't have to keep watching the races virtually while wearing his, you know, Monopoly Man suit. (laughs) (laughs) Monocle and all. Monopoly Man actually does not have a monocle. I know. (laughs) I know. I remember that. that. He's got that redonkulous top hat, for God's sake. And yes, he does. <laughs> of Thayer. If, if you have not, if you have not seen Demon Thayer in his top hat, do yourself a favor and look it up. Don't yeah, do, don't do, it. <laughs> do it. It's great. Don't do it. I just a mustache wanna, on well, there, maybe. I I gotta. I can't say anymore because I'm gonna go into really bad territory. But okay. <laughs> 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 All right, that's a well deserved well cow patty for uh, for for the demon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, why don't you go next? Sure. Well, it's another show favorite of ours. Uh, one of our our junior senator from Kentucky, oh, uh, Senator Paul. <laughs> and uh, I know he's earned a few in the past, but this one is a, is kind of. Just a little bit above outrageous to the absurd. Um, So the story basically is that uh, he wanted to argue with uh, one of our top, you know, immune disease doctors in the whole country uh, Mm -hmm. about what we should be doing to address this pandemic. And he wants to dismiss the, the opinions of experts because you know, everybody has an opinion. So why should we give it more weight if it comes from an expert, which if you just think about that statement for a second, you could probably come up with the reason why. Is he a lawyer? He is an eye doctor. Oh, he's an eye doctor. That's right. See, lawyers would understand the difference between expert opinion and opinion, you would think. Right, right. Well, he goes on to say that that his answer to this pandemic is that we just need to be a little more optimistic about things. Optometristic? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Put on your rose-colored glasses, kids. Um, You know, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. You know, it's it's still going to be a pig. Turn that Um, frown upside down and that'll take care of COVID. Well, you know, he got through it. So, you know, while exposing, you know, the whole chamber. Yeah. To the disease. Um, so, yeah, he's he's got wow. my cow patty for this. Well-deserved, well-deserved cow patty. Uh, he has so many. He must have a very well-fertilized garden by now. Yeah, the, you know, the, the neighbors I, complaining about all that shit. <laughs> oh, don't get his neighbors involved. <laughs> he doesn't get along with the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fun fact. I used to be a neighbor to Mitch McConnell. I lived a block away from him. So, oh, God. Is that really the greatest, fun? <laughs> the greatest thing when you when he makes these comments and they go viral on, on social media is inevitably it always comes back to his neighbor. And it's worth yes. it's worth reading comments just for levity, just to have that break because <laughs> it is so funny. And I read one from a lady that I had never, uh, I'd never seen comment before that absolutely, I lost it. I mean, completely lost it because she's like, um, I forget what his exact words were, but it was something about the virus. And she's like, (laughs) she (laughs) said, (laughs) it must've been funny. She said, well, he ought to know he's the worst virus of all. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. (laughs) <laughs> and then the very next comment was <laughs> to get his neighbor back out there and i was like oh my god wow uh, oh, no. left in kentucky Harsh. does not condone any form of violence against <laughs> this is true this is true we do not oh god. Uh, I'm so moving on moving on uh <laughs> well-deserved cow patty there uh good luck with your garden there Rand. <laughs> um so my cow patty Uh, fresh in the news um there was a actually not fresh in the news there was a uh a court filing on june 1st in boone county circuit court where the florence speedway 
Little Links to Learning, Daycare Center in Fort Mitchell, and Beans Cafe and Bakery in Dry Ridge are suing Bashir and the and others to overturn the restrictions on uh, on COVID-19, the COVID-19 restrictions on businesses. Uh. Yeah. Um, so these three companies uh, have decided that, you know, the the saving people from COVID-19 and trying to prevent the spread is erroneous, is onious. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, and they, are, they are looking to uh, they are fi- have filed to get that overturned. And not only that, but Kentucky's attorney general, Daniel Cameron, is trying to join the lawsuit on the plaintiff's side to also you know, get it overturned. Oh, makes you glad that Andy's a lawyer. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of that one press conference where Andy Somebody asked Andy about uh, being sued for restrictions, and he was like, bring it on. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Right. I've been sued before. Bring it on. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but here's the problem is that they are specifically now, the way that this is coming down is they're, the the Republican legislators are helping to direct this effort by choosing businesses specifically within judges that they are no that they already know are friendly to their beliefs. Yeah. Yep. And that and that's why some of these cases, you know, and of course, you know, the our, our, my favorite, you know, Stepford Barbie legislator. Uh, <laughs> I know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. <laughs> right. <laughs> See my big gun. Um, uh, she is just like left and right. Every time one of these cases comes out, oh, he lost again. Oh, he lost again. And and you read it and it's just like, I, I, I question how these judges ever got put into the position that they're in. And it makes me feel like, you know, we've all been under shut a cloud for so freaking long that you know it's been overtaken. The judiciary has been overtaken in Kentucky mm-hmm. long before we started worrying about what McConnell's doing at the federal level. Because some of these, you know, judgments are just, you know, they're not constitutionally sound. Yeah, it's the good old boy network. In it action. is because. You know, precedent is there that serving the greater good, the greater health of everyone in the state has always come out on top, as it should. Yeah. You know, people's lives matter more than a, any single business. There are things that can and should be done, you know, to, to help so that we don't lose all those businesses. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you right now, on this case, the fact that there's a daycare center involved, yep. if I had a child young enough to be in daycare, you can bet your sweet ass that I would never take that child to a daycare center that was fighting to have these kinds of things removed because I would no longer consider my my child safe there. Exactly. So they're going to they're going to lose money no matter what. Yeah. I mean, that's stupid. That's cutting off your nose to spite your face. When, when working with children, you know, whether as a, as a teacher in the classroom or, or working with young kids in a daycare center, you, the, the number one part of my job is to make those kids safe, make that environment safe, make what? their parents feel secure. What? I mean, these, these you're concerned about are... the safety of the children? <laughs> <laughs> that's not just... capitalism. I I just can't uh, the I just can't with these people anymore. Uh, um, it's spite, like I'm you said, spite your face. Point. Yeah, and they're the, mad. And the additional defendants in the lawsuits, uh, it's not just Bashir. So Bashir's named, but also the Northern Kentucky Independent Health District is named. The director of that organization, uh, or no, the director of uh, yeah, and its director, the director of that organization, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services Secretary, Eric Friedlander, mm-hmm. and the Public Health Commissioner, Dr. Stephen Stack, are all also named in the lawsuit as defendants. It's spite. 
they don't, they well, don't like that those guys are popular. That, that well, it's not just like. that. It's stupid. It is stupid because by definition, their very jobs make them the experts in the field to make decisions based on health. There's no way. There is no way that you name all those people and actually believe you have a shot at winning. This is a publicity stunt. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, absolutely. It is. I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't going to go anywhere. You know, it's not going to go anywhere. Right. So it just it just comes up. It comes up the court systems and, and they get to make a point and and rally the base they get around their tweets. it. Yeah, yeah. They get their tweets in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So so those so those groups. And once again, just so that you can make note of that, that's the Florence Speedway. Little Links to Learning Daycare Center in Fort Mitchell and Beans Cafe and Bakery in Dry Ridge. Uh, they are they are my recipients of the cow pen <laughs> for this week. Moo. Moo. All right. Moving on to better news. Better news. Bull well, we horns. have a bullhorn. Yay. So tell us about our bullhorn, Amy. Well, I would like to give a big congratulatory bullhorn to the voters in the state of Kentucky for turning out for this primary. Um, you guys did a wonderful <laughs> job. Um, let's double it, triple it in uh, November. Yeah, so turnout was, was for, for one, for a primary, and two, for a primary where the primary, where the main way of voting was mail in to have we ended up with uh what were the numbers again and you had the numbers it was 30 um, 32, it was 32 percent for democrats and it was like 27 28 percent for republicans yeah in a primary that's amazing is it a record no but it's darn close 2008 set the record um, but it was darn close to that yeah, and, you know, one of the things to look at, if you remember, <clears throat> two years ago when we were sitting here in 2018, we were all bemoaning the fact that um, Kenton County, Boone County, Campbell County, the big three up here, all fell to the bottom five counties in the state in terms of primary turnout. Yep. In fact, Kenton, Kenton County was the very lowest in the entire state at 10%. Yep. All of them, all of them were over 20%. Yeah. So more than double the turnout. And a lot of people are going to say, you know, well, it's a presidential year. We had this big U.S. Senate race. I don't give two flying you-know-whats about what the motivation is. The fact of the matter is we got more people, you know, over double the amount of people out there. More people are paying attention. And now we need to to uh, capitalize on that. We need to expand that. We need to keep those people engaged and energized and keep, you know, spreading it. Although I wish it would wait until the last, you know, it didn't always wait until the last two or three weeks. But <laughs> I was very happy with that. <laughs> the other thing is that um, Franklin County, which is where you know, um, Frankfurt is, it's where our, our state right. capital is, had the highest turnout in the state. And it was um, well over 40 percent, almost 50 percent. Wow. So we need we need graphics all over the place. Be like Franklin County. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, we it's 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 great that we're where we're at. Now we need to keep pushing and we need to make it even better. Um, to let your representatives know that you want mail-in voting in November. Yep. You demand it. Absolutely. So, uh, so excellent bullhorn. Well, well earned, well earned there. And that, uh, that, that transitions us nicely into, actually, I'm going to play the bullhorn award sound one more time. Cause it makes Ann laugh. <laughs> <laughs> It makes me want to drink. I don't know why. <laughs> like I should be giving a toast, you know, like around the table with the Vikings and stuff. Uh, <laughs> too, is that too specific? In my head of some like old video game. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that transitions us nicely into uh, discussing the um, 
the uh, primary results that we just had after a week after the primary, which it took a week to get all the uh, all the mail in ballots counted. Um, so before we even talk about the specific results, I want to talk about what an amazing job Kentucky actually did in this primary with the uh, with the mail in voting. And it has now become a model for other for the other states. There are other states calling Kentucky to go, how did you do it? And you would know it by looking at the, the newspapers and yeah. headlines and stuff. Now, were there Everything. issues? Yes, there were issues. Absolutely, there were issues. Um, but overall, it was, it was handled as well as I think could be better than could be expected under the circumstances with such a short time frame to plan for it and to make adjustments. I hope that they keep, keep all those in place all those mechanisms in place for November. Yeah. I mean, you know, <sighs> <we're gonna> do- <laughs> <laughs> you just know it's going to be always, profound. When I, know. I was just going to say that always prefaces something epic for man. So now the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> when, do, when do I ever not risk stepping in it? But at the risk of doing so, here I go. Um, <laughs> and we're going that, in. That narrative was pushed in a, in a way that, in a way it should not have been, and it did not come from the media. Okay, but media outside of the state, especially, picked up on it and ran with it. Mm-hmm. as did certain famous people who thought that they were, I guess, helping. Right. Um, but I want to give a massive, this should, this should also be, Roberto, one of our good awards. I want to give a huge shout out to Philip Bailey and Joe Sonka, both a uh, political yes. reporter from the Courier Journal, because they stayed on top of that story and they made sure that the truth was getting out and they were continually beating the drum of quit with this narrative because it's not true. Yes. So I give them mad, mad, mad props because they really did a phenomenal job of saying this just is not the case. Um, You know, we knew the system wasn't going to be perfect because of all of the conditions that led to it being what it was. And, you know, I'm also going to give credit to Michael Adams, you know, Mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Because he went against his party and he went against the lead. He had a shit ton. You, that, that man was probably getting screamed at every single day by members of the legislature who belonged to his party because they didn't believe in doing any of this. And I give him a ton of credit for putting people first. Right. Yep. Um, you know, I might not agree with him on much, but on this, I certainly did. And it was, you know, there's a certain amount of courage that goes into him taking the stance that he did and proving that it could be done. Now, unfortunately, You know, when you have Damon Thayer and all these others now stepping up with their bullhorn about normal in November, it appears as if uh, Adams is now starting to cave a bit. Right. However, you know, with the numbers that are not going down and staying down with the you know, the the first wave has never ended. We, We haven't left the peak yet, which people don't seem to understand which means that the first wave is going to actually run into the second wave. You know, come November, it's a tidal wave. It is a tidal wave. And they they don't have the sense God gave a goose to even think about that. (laughs) Have you ever been stalked by a goose? I mean, those guys are brutal. Brutal. But at least we have this in place. And, And I think that, you know, it, Michael Adams has to at least have some intelligence to have gotten to the position that he's at. 
he has to at least be objective enough to look at everything that went down and the way it went down and know where certain pitfalls were. So I look at the primary as more of a test run for the general because I think fixing those pitfalls is easier than trying to, you know, rebuild the wheel, so to speak. Yep. So on very on very short notice, I think um, those changes could be implemented, and I hope that that is a continual drumbeat in the back of his mind. But you yep. know, my point is that this this narrative was a narrative that was pushed; it was deliberately pushed, and and people need to keep that in mind. Yep. Oh yeah, and I think we also need to. I mean, we need to seriously look at the places where there were issues because where there were issues, they were bad, like Louisville. Louisville right. was a bad situation for the voting. Yes. The, the traffic trying to get there to vote was backed up for hours. And those people ended up being denied the ability to vote. Yes. Um, they only kept the polls open, I think, for a half hour past six. I think they only stayed open till 630. And and they did, gave no consideration for for the traffic issue. Um, okay, that's not really true, though. And you got and again, this is a part of looking at the truth and a part of looking at the reporting that came out. Yeah, because anybody whose car was in line by six o'clock, they marked the line. And so those people got in. Because it was only like a half hour long, which is why they only extended voting by a half an hour. And in fact, Booker's people filed, you know, wanted to get an injunction to leave polls open till nine o'clock. But the fact of the matter is that the judge drove there herself. And how many judges would do that? So I'm going to give man props to her too. drove there herself to see firsthand what the situation was like. And then based on what she saw. And the people who were there denied continuing that injunction until nine o'clock. And she followed the letter of the law and she wrote it, hand wrote it. It's in cursive writing that I can't read, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is pretty rare because I'm pretty good at that. So for me not to be able to read it, I knew she was probably writing on her steering wheel. But, you know, she hand wrote the order denying that injunction. For a judge to go to that level, it shows that, you know, she real recognized what a, what a serious situation this was. And she took all everything into consideration. The other thing is that, you know, they talk about how the doors were locked and there was a video of um, people yeah, rushing banging in. on the doors. and Right, right. But let me explain. Look, look at it in context, okay? The people that they let in were those people who had already been in line with their cars by six o'clock, which is the cutoff time. So they were in line. They got to go. There were a hundred. There ended up being about a hundred people. Now put that in context of the fact that the entire rest of the totality of the day, 10,000 people voted there. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, you know, you can't just look at that one piece of it i think it could probably be able to open a few more places in in you know voting places in cities like louisville and lexington now that i that i do agree with i think that you know we all know that the population in louisville is you know the it's the biggest urban center in the state it's the, it's the largest concentration of population that we have in the entire state yep so should there be more than one place open for them? Most certainly. I don't think anyone would deny that. <laughs> but the fact that they got 10,000 people through that one place in one 12 hour day. Oh, yeah. I think it went very smoothly from even from personal anecdotes I've heard from people that went and voted there that day. Um, right. Right. And it was and very it's smooth. Not saying either that, you know, nobody, I don't believe anybody's right to vote should be clipped or any, anything like that. I'm saying that <clears throat> I just don't think it was the magnitude that people tried to make it out to be based on the reporting that I have seen from people who live in Louisville. I would agree with you. Yeah. 
All righty. Um, so with that, let's uh, let's talk about some of the um, some of the actual results, uh, particularly as they pertain to District Four, since District Four is our focus. Um, why don't we start off with the uh, with the congressional race uh, primary race between Alexandra Owensby, Doctor Alexandra Owensby, and Shannon Fabert? Uh, I think most people know that uh, Doctor Owensby. Uh, won that fairly handily by about a 60-40. Uh, I think it was like 58-42 or something like that, but basically a 60-40 uh, variance. Uh, thoughts about that that race and, and that result? Uh, I think that Alexandra got her name out there a little more successfully. Um, based on my limited social media presence, um, <laughs> I <I'm> very... <laughs> limited especially um but i just felt like she did a better job um and that you know her being a nurse sort of upped her profile a bit yeah um, and you know of course they're both wonderful people and mm-hmm. would be infinitely better than thomas massey but i think uh those two things kind of gave her the edge yeah, I think she got out early. Uh, she definitely got out early and got her name around. Um, and then she had a particularly uh, popular exchange with uh, Thomas Massey and some of the Massey supporters on his Twitter account. And I think that's where I think that's where her campaign really gained a lot of followers. Mm-hmm. I think that people seeing that hey, she's willing to go toe to toe and 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 uh, yeah and and take them on and, and take on people like that. I think that impressed a lot of people. So uh, I think she picked up people there. Hey, Ann, are you banned from Thomas Massey's Twitter? <laughs> or did you see it? No, you would, no. She's no. banned from Damon Thayer's. <laughs> yeah. Damon, I'm banned from Thayer's. I'm banned from his team, his campaign account. I'm banned from his Facebook page. <laughs> He has banned me across the board. Maybe maybe we do have a thing. What do you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, you know, I think this race, um, I, I think it came down to exactly what you guys talked about. Number one, Alexander got out there a he- months ahead of Shannon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and, and she was visiting, you know, the counties furthest away from us because she was down in Boyd County in Ashland and she was all the way down in the, in the, um, uh, Louisville Metro area and the, um, ah, crap. Sure. What's my O County? Oldham. 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 Thank you. God. Tongue tied. Big win in Oldham County. She was down in Oldham County. Um, well, she had, she had, uh, she had Seth, uh, Seth Hall support. He's the chair of the Oldham County Democrats, and he ran for the same office in 2018, and he endorsed her for this race. Yep. Although the split there wasn't as big as it had, was in other counties, because she only she took Oldham County by about 500, just under 500. Mm-hmm. Um, split was bigger in other counties. Um, but I think, like I said, she just got it out there earlier. I didn't even know about Shannon, I don't think, until maybe November, December of last year. Yeah. But I knew about but I knew about Alexander last summer. So that's that's a giant span of time um, to be out there. And as for her, you know, exchange with Thomas Massey, I don't know if impressed is the word I would use. But it, it isn't. certainly it, it, it certainly garnered her a, a boatload of attention, you right. know, whether shock, I think was, would be a good word. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I remember the word you used at the time, but I won't mention it now. Um, <laughs> you just don't see, that. you know, you don't, you don't see candidates going after each other in that way uh, on each other's pages and stuff like that so so shock was certainly involved um 
And maybe there is, I definitely think there is something about the electorate this year. And, and I've seen it in every race where there's, a there's just a desire. People want to see, and, and I'll use your words, Roberto, because they were spot on. People want to see that fight. You, yeah. you know, they want to see that their candidates are, are, you know, ready for battle. Good That's because there's no baseball or football. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no, I think I think it's because they want to know that their representative is going to stand up for them. They know it's going to be a tough battle if they get elected, and they want somebody that that can yeah. that can fight if they need to. Yeah, yeah, and doesn't just kind of gloss over, smooth everything over, and yeah. make everything and d make everything pretty. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. And I would say those those that combination of things definitely you know, played in her, it played in her favor. I also agree with Amy. There's something about, you know, with us being in the me middle of a pandemic that we have a nurse, a, a, an actively working nurse who's running for this office. And, you know, healthcare is a number one concern for the vast majority of Kentuckians. So all of these things played in her favor. Um, I don't think any of that negates Shannon's quality as a candidate because I do think you know um, they're both exceptional women I think both of them um, have the potential for having a, a long um, yes. career in politics if they Agreed. want it because, Agreed. because they're I both hope Shannon runs quality. for something yeah I mean they're both just high quality kind caring um, smart, savvy women who, you know, who could do a lot for Kentucky, who could do a lot for the people in District 4 in any capacity that they chose to follow. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. And I, I, I would actively support both of them without question. Excellent. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the uh, Senate race. Where we have? Oh, do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's a little bit of interest in our Senate race this year. Um, uh, I, I've heard from a couple of people that there might be interest outside of the state, even in our Senate race. Oh, I'm sure. Um, Imagine that. Yeah. So aside from the twenty some odd people we had running, I know it wasn't really twenty, but it was close to twenty. Um, <laughs> uh, we had basically three uh, three main candidates in that race and that of course was amy mcgrath and charles booker and mike broyer um i think everybody's probably aware that amy mcgrath won the nomination uh in a very close uh what came down to be a very close vote between her and charles who came on very strong in the last month or so um so what do you think about this race? I, I, I know from, I, I think we had candidates that were running very hard. I think Mike and Charles both campaigned very hard in the primary. And um, Amy, I, I'm not, I didn't see what I would consider really hard campaigning from nope. her in the primary. Um, I don't know if it was, a, if it was a case of she thought she had it in the bag or, or what. I think she's just not very good at it. I hate to say it, but <laughs> not very good at campaigning. Uh, yeah, I, I don't mean, think I, that's it. you don't think that's it? Nope. This would have been a very different race if it had been in Bay. I can tell you that. Yes, yes. That's you know, three weeks ago, what we saw would not have taken place, and and for some reason. That has escaped 99% of the people. <laughs> hey, I'm a part of the 1% finally. <laughs> you are the 1% now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, each one of them, you know, of the top three, each, each one of them had a different path um, to get to a win and, and played the game differently. Um, you know, Obvious, everybody, you know, everybody wants to focus on the fact that Amy McGrath had all this money, 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 and we all she know does now, have a lot of money. She does, but ninety-seven percent 
97 percent comes from outside the state of Kentucky. Yep. Yes. Which, you know, and, and people say, you know, signs don't vote. People say money doesn't vote. But here's the thing. They chose, and I don't think this was just her doing or her decision because she has 57 million expert, quote unquote, experts around her and people giving her advice and everything else. They chose to run this campaign as a general campaign from the beginning. Mm -hmm. They never ran it like a primary campaign. Yeah, that's true. And, And that's very, very clear from the fact that despite the overwhelming majority that that Booker took in Louisville, you know, she was able to offset this, this is crazy when you look at these numbers. She was able to offset his Lexington win with just Kenton County. Wow. And I, I don't know that a lot of people realize that. But here's the other thing that that elevates. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> is the importance of Northern Kentucky. We this know. is going to be the second year in a row that Northern Kentucky makes th- or breaks a race. It's so I funny. I can hear you just. I know you hear you banging. <laughs> oh. Well, it's like, it's like, how much more proof do you need when just one of our counties offset Fayette County, which has never happened before as, that I know of. But man, I'd be willing to spend some time looking into that next year when we have nothing to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's, you know, I, I think you can say, I mean, uh, you can, candidates historically in Kentucky have ignored Northern Kentucky, thinking that can, Northern Kentucky doesn't matter. They've always focused on, on, on uh, Louisville, Lexington, and sometimes the mountains. Not really. No, I mean, you have the golden go triangle. Back. Yeah. You have to go back to then. You have to go back and you have well, to look at the Well, but you back 20 that. years. Okay. But you've had the same people in the state for, ex- with some minor jockeying. You've had the same people in the state running the Democratic Party for the last 20 years. Yes. Oh, well, Ben's and new. That, huh? Ben Self is new. It's I like said some minor jockeying. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I just... mean, anybody, anybody that's come in new it, since we've been new, I don't really count. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> Because you're looking at a strategy now. You're looking at the way things have gone down over the last 20, maybe even 25 years, where, you know, we used to be the pinnacle of the Golden Triangle. And we have lost all but four seats that Democrats used to hang out in all of Congressional District 4. Mm -hmm. From, From Louisville Metro over to Ashland, all but four. And one of those is just a recent pickup. I mean, Dr. Karen Berg's spectacular special set, uh, election. special election win was the first time that a Democrat has held that seat in 25 years. Yeah, that was amazing. So happy yeah. for that. She was such a great I mean, candidate, though. Me yeah. too. But, you know, it just kind of further backs up my point that for so long there has been this same mentality the same strategy the same thinking and it's not going to win anymore and the sooner people understand that and start changing the ways that they look at these races you know we're doomed to a future of of nothing but republican rule and all this crap that we have going on until people are, are willing to to say hey wait maybe you have a point yeah. Or, hey, hey, wait, you know, what if we turn the box this way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's even, a tiny change. Even with the new strategy and stuff, I mean, we still have a hard time getting candidates to focus on northern Kentucky again. I mean, even this right. year, you know, when, uh, you know, as, as we were putting together the, the forum um, back in back in February and March before the plague hit, 
um, you know, we still had to have a lot of conversations with campaigns to to lock that in and 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 make yep. that going of, you know, you need to come up here to northern Kentucky and you need to talk to people and, and you, you need to have a presence up here. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know, you know, but the, but the thing is, the one thing that the primary um, forced them graph campaign to do that I know that they was not a part of their original plan is the amount of money that she did have to spend on the primary down the stretch. Yeah. However, that giant bankroll allowed her to do it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the most expensive media market in the state of Kentucky is the national market which covers that bottom row of counties yeah. across the Kentucky Tennessee border. And she sunk, uh, they sunk what, $2 million into ads just down there. Wow. No, other, no other campaign had the capacity to do that. No. Um, but, and that's fine. That, that kind of falls back on that primary strategy a little bit, or at least gives her, it gave her more options than anybody else ever had. Yep. So, but now she's got to answer for this, you know, h- how does she transition now to the general? Because she's been running a general race all along and it shows the crack. I mean, it shows how cl- she, she didn't garner, you know, 50% of the vote on her own. Yeah. So she didn't she get a mandate. Say, <laughs> and here's another thing, another heads up for, for all campaigns, right? Of the top three, um, Mike Breuer came in first in terms of the amount of money he, he spent per vote. He spent less money per vote than Amy McGrath and less money per vote than Charles Booker. In fact, Charles Booker spent the most money per vote. Hmm. I thought Amy. The- I thought Amy ended up spending the most money per vote. I don't think so. Okay. I don't nice. think so. I'll look at it. I'll that. look at it again. But but still, it just goes to show, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I know, know what I would really like to see from Amy is I would like to see her really take notice of what happened in this primary and how close she came to losing the primary and really honestly engage with the progressive groups of Kentucky. That is something I have not seen her campaign do. Um, Not engage um, and be reluctant to be part of, it seems like. And I get it. She's, you know, she's a moderate Democrat, whatever. Um, That is what it is. But if she has any hope of actually winning this election against uh, against Moscow Mitch, she really has to, I think, engage those progressive elements honestly and openly across the state of Kentucky and really take that to heart. Um, I will agree with you, but I think she has a bigger problem than the progressive groups. And what do you think? And that, I think she needs to be like spend a a boatload of time in Louisville, in Lexington, in other counties where, um, you know, you you have a a community, any any size community of black folks because she offended them yeah. point blank on several occasions. This wasn't just a one time thing. I mean, she virtually smacked him in the face a few times. And I'm sorry, but whoever is doing her Twitter account needs to be fired immediately. (laughs) Immediately. Because they're terrible. The tweets that she puts out, that that, that campaign puts out, are just tone deaf, insensitive, stupid, and are causing her more headaches than she needs. So I don't know who her digital media manager is. I don't know who her specific Twitter handler is, but they need to have a come to Jesus moment and Jesus needs to win Yeah, because it's, it's yeah. really bad. Um, you know, 
you just can't keep walking into it when when you, all the evidence is right there in front of you. I mean, first they were invited for her to speak on the Jones report. And, you know, Jones Media is owned by Kimberly Cecil Jones. She's a black woman in Louisville who has, you know, yep. just a significant amount of respect and presence and, and everything in that community. She's awesome. She's amazing. And to to deny an opportunity to, to, to say no, you know, we can't fit that in our schedule. Oh, hell no. Yeah. It's the it's i mean how how do you not say we will clean anything off our schedule to be there that's the because only these people are not from kentucky and they have no idea <laughs> that's that's the only acceptable response but then you know you had the whole thing with the the flub at the kep forum where she was asked point blank if she had been out and yeah. And, and any other protests and stuff. And it was this stuttering, stumbling. Oh, well, uh, you know. How does she not expect and... that question? That's why I know. Right. How, how does her handlers mm-hmm. not send her into that interview prepared for that question? Right. Okay. So there's firing number two from her staff. <laughs> because clearly there is. You know, and that's probably a communicate either communication team person or a political team person or both. But clearly, someone not in touch with reality is giving her <laughs> horrendous advice. And folks, we've been down this road before. We went down this road with Thousand Grimes. I'm not burning at the stake again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just like if if you're a Democrat in Kentucky right now. You have deja vu on a daily fucking basis. Excuse my language, but I'm just off my chain now. I I cannot, <laughs> I cannot stand. I cannot stand one more thing. It's like there's no. <laughs> oh, there's going to be one more thing. She's a woman on the well, edge. I'm well, telling you. You know, buckle for up. 24 hours. Shut your campaign down. Shut your top. Stay up in a room with yourself. And have a real meeting about all of these things. And if anybody on that team is from D.C. giving you advice about how to talk to people in Kentucky about issues in Kentucky, send them back to D.C. Because this isn't working. And yeah. we she needs can't to hire continue. Mike. I, th- I think what you see is, and this happens on all, on all campaigns, right? All big campaigns like that. People come from other campaigns around the country and they move from campaign to campaign. And I know that, you know, Amy's campaign has picked up, I'm, I'm sure she's picked up a lot of really good people like from, um, you know, Elizabeth Warren's campaign or um, any of the others that fell out. Um, I, I know the Yang Gang went to Breuer's campaign or a number of them did. Um, I don't know if any of the other groups, but I'm sure they've gotten some of those. And I, there she needs got to be some Bloomberg people, I think. You know, we we hear. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, you know, in the primaries, right? You hear about oh, Iowa politics is unlike any other politics, and you got to know Iowa, and Iowa's just different, and Iowa's Iowa, and then New Hampshire's New Hampshire politics, and New Hampshire's New Hampshire, and and I think that's all true. But why is it when we get to the late states, suddenly it's everybody thinks it's a cookie cutter and they know what's going on in these states like Kentucky? Right. It's it campaigns. You know, politics in general is, is especially at the federal level, is very um, incestuous. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're talking about, well, let's say this big race level, because yeah. I would include like governorships and things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 exactly like you said. It's very incestuous where the same people move around state to state to work on campaigns. Most the vast majority of them college students or college age who have um, a, a background in political science. And, you know, they've learned the best way to do organizing with with campaigns or they've learned the best and the newest way to do um, direct voter contact, whatever that may be. And it gets 
you know, it, and it just spreads from one to the others to where now, okay, now everybody's doing text messages, everybody's doing this, everybody's doing, that. you yeah. know, it just, that's, that's the nature of the beast. But the problem is, and, and, and maybe I'm the only one that thinks this way, the problem comes with um, messaging and people to people. That Targeted direct- demographics. Mm, within a given area for example you know like roberto was talking about i don't know if you would put this under the political director the communications director or what but i think you need to have a, a minimum of one person on each one of those teams at a high level who is from the state that you live in you need yep. people who know how to talk to their own people yep. you know how how we talk about Healthcare in Kentucky is going to be different from how they talk about healthcare in New York. I don't care if you're pushing the same thing. I don't care what your position is. If you're a Medicare for all or a or, or a you know single payer or if you're a ACA person, whatever it is, how you talk. You know, I I do not ever foresee myself being able to go to New York and talk to people about it. Right. But I know I can go into Kentucky and talk to people about it. Because I know I can put it into terms that, you know, the people that grew up hearing the same kinds of things that I heard all the time will understand. And, you know, it, what what we're seeing is a direct result of too many outsiders having an opinion because too many outsiders are, are at those higher level positions. And and I, think I, know, I think it's OK for outside. I think it's OK for outsiders to come in and have opinions and, and offer advice and stuff like that. But there needs to be there needs to be that person that says that that listens to that advice and says, OK, I hear what you're saying. I think we might be able to adapt that for Kentucky, but right. we need to do it this way, because in Kentucky, you, you know, you can't say, you know, you can't say pop. You have to say Coke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. People people yeah. will look at you with a side eye. Yeah. If you say pop. Yes, yes, yeah. And that's and and I agree with you, Roberto. I didn't mean to say you can't ever bring anybody. No. I mean, I worked with last year on the statewide coordinating campaign. I worked with amazing kids from all over the country. Love them to death. Mm-hmm. Um would wouldn't wouldn't trade any of them for the price tea in China. They were all hard workers. They knew what they were doing. They knew what field organizing was about. Um, you know, but I can tell you that every single one of them at one point in the campaign or another over the months that we were together, you know, either we sat as one and had a conversation or they came to me individually and said, okay, you know, this is what we're supposed to be talking about. How should I, how should I say that here? Because I'm getting some weird looks if I say X, Y, Z. You know, right. So that's that's why you need that on every campaign at every level. There needs to be at least one voice that has a a prominence that can say, "Okay, now, you know, we're and even in Kentucky. And I talk about this all the time, how territorial it is. Yeah. The way we talk about an issue up here in northern Kentucky and say Fort Mitchell, it's going to be very different. From how I talk about the same thing when I go out with, you know, Virginia Maher down in Breathitt County in eastern Kentucky. Yep. The way we approach people even within the state is very different. So you, oh, you, yeah. you always need, you know, that, that local voice to help you. And right now what her campaign needs more than anything is some healing in Louisville. Yep. Um, as I, as I told somebody a couple weeks back, whoever won this race, I said not only – do we need to win Louisville? But it needs to be one with the a minimum, a minimum of the same numbers that we had last year. We actually, because it's the presidential year with Trump at the top of the ticket, we actually need more votes out of Louisville than right. that. Yeah. And the way things sit right now, she ain't going to get it. And there aren't enough independents. There aren't enough suburban soccer moms to make up that <laughs> difference. Yeah. They're just not even though those two areas are actually where the electorate is moving right now. Right. I mean, it's it's the suburban uh suburban women are the ones and independents are the ones that are shifting to the democratic side and, and to these, you know, 
kinder, gentler positions, if you will. But there aren't enough of them in Kentucky to overcome significant um, not, you know, votes not turning out in Louisville. Yep. We got to get over the apathy. Yep. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we've covered uh, covered the big news from the primary. Um, hope uh, hope you hope the advice is is heeded and uh, you know to uh, Amy McGrath's campaign that that advice is all free of charge. Anything else, uh, you can give us a call and we'll be happy to well, give then. you our rate sheet. <laughs> Negotiate a fee. The, the first the first level of advice is free. The rest you have to pay for. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, but now is the time, you know. It's so funny because with the primary being pushed back, normally the primary is at the end of May and, and, and June is, is a breather. You right. know, June is a take a week off, yep. re, re, regroup, start start planning a little bit and get ready to hit the ground running in July. Well, today's July 1st. Yeah, we're taking so this weekend. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we there's no rest for the wicked. There's no, you know, we, everybody's got to get over their feelings, get in the game and let's go right now. Pick yeah. a candidate, people. Pick a candidate. Uh-huh. Yep. People yeah. need to pick a candidate. So yeah, yeah. And find a you, campaign. Yeah, and there are plenty of them at both, you know, the the state house level, the state senate level, the congressional level, the the senate level, the presidential level. There is everything out there. It's a smorgasbord of campaigns. Pick one, yep. including Quite. our own Roberto Enriquez yes. running yes. in the sixty sixth district. Yes, I am. And I would be more than happy to have your help. And that's the thing. Find a campaign to work on. Um, I'd love to have you on my campaign. You want to come work on my campaign? Let me know. Um, But find a campaign to work on. Find a state level campaign. I will tell you, if you're trying to figure out where to put your efforts, you know, the state campaigns are always starved for people. We always need people, especially during these years when we have presidential campaigns and Senate campaigns, because they take a a lot of the people, a lot of people. Yes, they do. Um, And so the the state level campaigns get even more starved for for help and volunteers. Um, So and and I know I'm on a state level campaign and and of course I'd like that. But even if it's not mine, um, I highly encourage you to get involved in a state level campaign. If you want to split your time, you know, give five hours to a week to a state level campaign and give five hours a week to uh, to a federal level campaign. Um, But but really think about that and really, really try to help out the state level campaigns, um, because that that affects your daily life more than the federal campaigns. Um, Absolutely. And get people registered to vote and excited about voting. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I'm more of, and, and you know this, I mean, there's there's tons of groups out there, tons of people that talk about registering people, but in all honesty, that's not the problem. I mean, we're talking about how great it is that Democrats turned out at 32%. That means 68% of registered right. Democrats were not involved in the process. That number of people is way higher than any new people that we're ever going to register. We right. need yep. to, be to get excitement out. levels up. Yeah, we need, well, we need to reach them. We need yep. to be reaching out to these people that either rarely or never engage in the system and say, hey, why aren't you involved and what can I do to get you there? Yep. You know, what do you need? to get there because I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Um, that, has, that that has to be number one. The other thing, and I'm going to play off what you said, Roberto, is because um, I, I did have a few people contact me yesterday about volunteering. And, and the number one step is for everyone to be um, honest with themselves. Look at your current schedule. Look at what, you, you know, whether you have yep. kids, a job, outside activity whatever it is take an honest look at your schedule so that you can say how many hours per week you can give 
and then decide which activities you can and are willing to do versus those you aren't. Because nothing's worse than the campaign, you signing up for a campaign and not giving them that, that idea. And then they want to obviously push you, push you, push you to do more and more and more. And then you get overwhelmed and then you walk away and you don't volunteer anymore. We can't afford to lose a single volunteer, but it all starts with the volunteer. So be honest. Hey, I've only got, you know, four hours a week I can give. I'll give you two hours on Saturday and I'll give you two hours on Wednesday night. And, you know, I'm an introvert. I really don't like to talk to people a lot, but I know that I can text or I know I can write letters to the editor or I know I can write postcards or I know I can deliver things without having to knock on doors. Anything that doesn't involve me directly talking to people. The more honest you can be, the better it helps campaigns plan, yep. you know, and, and the less likely you are to get frustrated with getting sucked up into all of it and feeling guilty. Oh, I can't do more. Y you know, no, <laughs> we all have our limits and, and we all have things that we can and can't do. If you're a chatty Kathy like me, hey, sign me up for the phone bank. I love talking. <laughs> to people. Nah. You know? I'll do four hours uh, every Saturday and I'll do, you know, an extra four hours on Tuesday, whatever your schedule is. Um, do know yourself, be honest with yourself, be honest with the campaigns and then get involved. And if you don't know where to, where to go, contact us. We'll help you. We will we'll help you connect to the campaigns in specific to your area yep. so that you, you can help the best that you can. Yeah, we're trying to encourage Ann to come out of her shell a little bit. I know. So it's, she's a little shy. <laughs> she's too shy. So that's going to wrap it up for this week in Left in Kentucky. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Make sure to share our podcast with your friends and your family and your enemies, for that for that matter. Um, <laughs> we'll be, we will not be recording this weekend because it's July 3rd weekend, uh, but we will be back recording the week after that. And I believe we have Jim Fiorelli who's running for the state Senate in Boone County again, yes. uh, running against, um, John Schickel. So that'll be Long a good one. So he'll be with us uh, when we come back after the 4th of July. So uh, until then, everybody. Stay safe, everyone. Stay yep. home if you can. Stay healthy. Wear a mask when you go out. Definitely. Yes. Definitely wear a mask. Stay healthy. And uh, we will talk to you later. Until then, this is Roberto Enriquez. Amy Ferguson. And Ann Dickerson. like having a cigar. Left in Kentucky is the podcast of Indivisible Northern Kentucky.